What's up, good people? Welcome to another episode of Better With Paul. Now, today, today's going to be crazy. Can I just say that? It just feels like it's going to be crazy. I think there's a surprise coming in just about, I think it takes five seconds. Let me see if the surprise is here or or, or we're going to be talking about some, some folks. All right. What's up, everybody? What's up? What's up? I see. So here, here's what I want to say. I see. Of course, I see. Of course, I see you, Tony, on Facebook. Of course, I see you, sis, on Periscope, right? Now, watch this, guys. For the first time, LinkedIn is now officially connected to StreamYard. LinkedIn is now officially connected to StreamYard. So, Teresa, I can see you on LinkedIn, right? Hold on. It's going so fast. Oh, my gosh. We got too many comments. I can't even uh, uh, big up everybody. So, look, I see you. There you go, Edward. I see you. See LinkedIn. I see you. Such a look at this. Look at this. This is crazy. We got LinkedIn, y'all. LinkedIn is up. So now, let me let me calm down. Let me calm down. I just LinkedIn. I'm so excited for you. I'm just so excited for you because it's been so long. And let me just say this. I want to say that in particular, I think it was Deb. Deb, I'm looking for you, Deb, because I think it was Deb that made LinkedIn happen because. About two weeks ago, I got a direct message from one of the folks who heads up video for LinkedIn, right? And he was like, look, I've been here. LinkedIn, I see you. Look at this. It's Actually, now there's a problem. There's so many LinkedIn comments, I can't even pu pull everybody on <laughs> now. But um, but uh, but I was like, hey, I told this the, the, the gentleman from LinkedIn, I said, I love LinkedIn video. I love it. But the issue is that I can't include the comments in my live stream and therefore it 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 it, it reduces the quality right of, of 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 LinkedIn as a viewing platform you know what I mean and then immediately after that I got this message from Deb saying that she was talking to StreamYard and and LinkedIn and then all of a sudden yesterday I got this message from StreamYard saying LinkedIn comments is up so look at that I mean I don't know how that happened but I want to thank Deb. I want to thank you, LinkedIn. I want to thank you. Just th thank everybody. Because now what's great is that I can really integrate everyone's thoughts on LinkedIn, just like I was doing with Facebook, just like I was doing with YouTube, just like uh, what I do with Periscope. So I think that's really good. See, look at this. My man, Rick. Rick loving the passion. Rick Clifton. I appreciate that. I'm just excited about this LinkedIn situation. And on top of that, I've had a massive cup of coffee, Rick. So that's what's going on here. So Look at that. I see you guys. I see you guys. All right. So now a couple things about today. Today is a very special, special day. And because it's such a special day, you know what I need you to do. And I want you to right now, please, everyone share this video. I will say, and I keep going back to this, is when we started, we had about maybe a thousand people, a thousand, we would have maybe two to 500 people that would come on live within the course of the hour, or you know I run a little bit long, so maybe hour to hour and a half, right? And then we would have another maybe one to 2,000 folks share across all of the platforms, right? That was about nine, 10 weeks ago. You guys tell me, I think it was about maybe not yet, yeah, nine, 10 weeks ago. Two day or this past Monday, so this past Monday, just four days ago, right? Five days, right? We had cumulatively, we had 11,000 people watch across all platforms over the course of the hour and a half. And then cumulative, we're at close to 40,000 views within four days across all of the platforms. And that is a tribute to you as a community, bottom line. And one of the big reasons why that happens is, is because you share the video. So please continue to share the video. That's something that I just ask everyone to do. So thank you very much. Uh, for everyone who's sharing. And then the last thing before we get into it, I just want to make sure that you are on the newsletter. Did you see the newsletter today? Did anybody see the newsletter, by the way? I dropped the newsletter. I dropped the first newsletter today, right? Today's newsletter was a recap of our session on how to invest in stocks, in cryptos, and startups, which by the way, we talked about crowdfunding for startups in that session. Today, we have the person I consider to be royalty. I, I consider her to be both king and queen of crowdfunding for equity. I think she has raised, she was the first person to ever raise over a million dollars in crowdfunding equity. She is on today. 
And so it, you know, it's a very special day, but the newsletter, right? The newsletter talks about how do you get into uh, crowdfunding uh, for equity, how to get into to startups, how to, you know, start uh, investing in cryptos. And, and, and so make sure you are on the newsletter list. And my commitment is the newsletter is just like this series is I'll keep dropping, you know, lessons, takeaways, and also you'll get summaries of these sessions and you'll get any slides, et cetera. And you'll get special, special stuff like this, this ebook that I'm working on that I promise is coming soon. So make sure you are on the newsletter. All right. Let's get it going, man. Let's get it going. All right. For, you know what? Real quick, just because we have LinkedIn real quick before we get it going. LinkedIn, let me tell you. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. She said I'm not receiving emails. Uh-oh. We got to do something about that. Inbox me. Just go ahead and inbox me on Facebook and, and we'll make that work. Okay. We'll make that work. All right. So now, before we get going today, before we get going today, I want to see where are you watching from? Where are you watching from? Because today we have what I consider to be a global panel, right? And what I try to do with the curation of these panels is I try to get perspectives from all over the world because I, you know, it was interesting coming from, you know, I was born in New York and spent most of my time in New York and Washington DC before moving here uh, to London three years ago. And one of the things that hit me about entrepreneurship in the United States versus entrepreneurship outside the States is that in the United States, I think we're so fixated on the ideas and opinions and stories of other US entrepreneurs, right? Every time you see the big magazines, big blogs, big podcasts, everybody's fixated on what US entrepreneurs are doing. But the moment, and I, and I was one of those, right? I, I'm a jerk, I still write for USA Today. Everyone I've interviewed has been US focused. Now, granted, it's USA Today, but we still have international news. But here's the point. When I got here to London, I realized that some of these stories out here are much richer, right? Much richer than a lot of the stories in the US. And I'm not saying one is better than the other, but what I am saying is that lessons can be extracted from everyone. And it's very important for us to listen to what's happening in the UK, what's happening in Ghana, what's happening in Nigeria, what's happening in Jamaica. By the way, if it's not happening in Jamaica, it's just not happening. That's just bottom line. So, but what is happening all over the world, right? So this, so this is very important. All right. So where are you watching from? Let's just see what the list looks like. I think we're going to break stream yards. Oh, look at this right out the gate. The, uh, actually, I, I think we're going to break stream yard today because there are so many comments flying that I can't even, I can't even pull up. I can't even pull up comments now. This is, this is, but I see Jamaica in the house. That's all I need. That's all I need. Jamaica is, is, is here. Okay. So now, let me walk you through what's going to happen today, because today today is a, is 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 a little different, right? Today's a little different. Today, we're going to have a town hall. All right, we're going to have a town hall, and town and and what I mean by town hall is that we are going to not have a panel, but instead, I've invited six entrepreneurs representing the you know the world, and they're going to come on individually. And we're going to spend just one-on-one -on -one time with them, about 10 minutes or so with them individually. And then I have something special for you lined up at the very, very end, right? So for everybody who stays until the very, very end, which this is gonna be a clean hour and a half, right? Then you'll see that very special thing that's gonna happen. Now, what are we talking about? Today, we're talking about pivoting, all right? We're talking about pivoting. And I decided that I would go to good old Google and I would jump, you know, type in, Google, I would type in pivot for business. What is, what is, what do you think Google, right? We think Google knows everything. What do you think Google, the meaning of pivoting as a business is? What do you think it is? And here's, here's what, uh, here's what Google said, right? Google said that the number one, right? The number one, at least in terms of SEO, what's got the highest ranking is actually coming from Quora, Quora, which is one of my favorite platforms. And Quora, someone there defined pivoting as a pivot occurs when a company makes a fundamental change to their business after determining, usually through market research, that their product isn't meeting the needs of their intended market, right? This is what they say a pivot is. 
product isn't meeting the needs of the market. So therefore there's a change in the business. And this is what I want to underscore to everybody watching because everyone watching, you're an entrepreneur, right? Whether you realize it or not, because of you know the freelancing economy, right? Everybody's an entrepreneur. And what I think most people believe is that pivoting is bad, right? Pivoting means something happened bad. Pivoting means that something wasn't working and therefore it's bad on you, the owner, or bad on you, the business. And so like shame on you, right? Shame on you for the pivot. But I want to tell you that pivoting is good. Not only is pivoting good, but I believe you can't, you know, there, there has not been one entrepreneur that I've ever interviewed who has had a, you know, 10 plus year career and they haven't pivoted multiple times in that career. A matter of fact, I think learning the art of pivoting is one of the most important skills we can develop as an entrepreneur is learning the art of pivoting. Like to me, but you know, like you always think about sharks, right? People always say, oh, you know, like a shark has to keep moving because that's how a shark gets its oxygen, right? The water goes through the gills, the gills extract the oxygen, but a shark must keep moving in order to live. Now that's technically true, but also yes and no. But really what it, what, what, what's happening with sharks is that a shark has to continue to get water in its gills, right? And some sharks don't swim, you know, don't, don't swim. Some, some sharks kind of crawl, right? But the key is that a shark must make movements so that water can get into the gills so that the gills can pull out the oxygen so that it can live. A shark must pivot in order to survive. If a shark is not pivoting, it doesn't survive. It doesn't live. You are a shark. I am a shark, right? Sometimes sharks get a bad rap, but in terms of entrepreneurship, we are sharks. If you are not moving, if you are not pivoting, you are going to die as an entrepreneur. Your business is going to die. So the beauty of today is today we are going to learn from entrepreneurs all over the world on how they are pivoting in this recession. Because this recession is throwing everybody off, right? This recession is, is, is crushing businesses. So we're going to hear from these entrepreneurs about, okay, all right, you hit the recession like all of us, you were doing one thing, you did your research, you determined that you can, all, you can no longer do that one thing, you now have to do something else, walk us through. How did you figure it out? How did you determine the second thing, right? How is it working for you? We are here all as students today to learn how to pivot. And that's all I got to say. Other than the fact that I promise you, uh, we are going to break streamed in comments because I think you could only get a thousand comments in, in, and I think we're, we're already at, I think we're already at 400 some odd comments. Like we're going to break stream yard today for sure, for sure. All right, look at that. And my man, Ron says, and sharks are one of the oldest species on the planet. There you go, there you go. All right, can we bring on our first guest? Can we bring on your, your um, our first guest? All right, for our first guest, look, look, my man G's like, who else is a shark? Raise your hand if you're a shark. Raise your hand if you're a shark. Okay, so now here, here's the first guest. All right, here's the first guest. Our first guest is first for a reason. It's, it's really because of him that we're doing this session, which this, I mean, I, I wish we did a session weeks ago, right? This is a critical session, but it's because of him that we're doing this. I was scrolling on, on, on Instagram and um, I follow him and I saw that he posted a, a video of news coverage where a reporter was covering about how he is pivoting in his business. And I thought this was interesting because he is in the event space, which I can't think of. I can't think of probably any industry that's been more impacted in this COVID-19 recession than events, right? We can't even get together anymore, right? Legally, we can't get together in some, some areas. So he pivoted and he created micro events. In particular, he's is, I think his, his core business prior to this was in the wedding space. So he's created micro weddings. Now, just chatting real quick before we came on, he was saying that, you know, micro events, micro weddings were all already in existence before this recession.
but he's doing something different, right? So because he just said that, in my mind, I thought that means he's 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 the king of the remix, which means that he is the ditty of the pivot. He's the ditty of the recession. He's the he's the ditty of events, right? He he he's the remix king. This is none other than my man, and you know him because he's a part of the community. My man, Andrew Roby. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! Come on, I, I can I can live up to the, the remix king. I, I can do that. <laughs> I was gonna say, you could do this. You could do this. Absolutely. All right, fair. So um, I see everybody saying, what's up, Andrew? Every, everyone loves you, right? Everyone loves you in the community here. So it's it's a, it's a blessing to have you. Yeah. W walk us through this thing, right? First, hit us with what were you doing prior to COVID-19, right? What, what did the business look like? So um, we were actually doing a bunch of corporate events. So I was before it was like the early part of March. I was actually in Dallas at the time um, with some of our clients and just working on their event that we were doing for June. And so we, I was doing a lot of traveling at that time because that's the slower part of the year for us. And so it gives us a chance to go and meet our clients and you know finalize a lot of stuff uh, that would be uh, integral to us executing our events for the latter part of the year. So yeah, March was literally an eye opener for us because we were getting ready to just start executing all of the events. And we were doing events like birthday parties and a lot of conferences and of course, weddings as, as well, but not as many weddings as our corporate and social events. So we were actually getting ready to start rolling out all of the stuff literally in at the end of March going into April. Man, so you were ready. I mean, and, and would you say, was this really the height of your business? I mean, was this the most successful that your business had been year to date? Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I'm not we, trying to rub it in, but. but. So we, we actually ended last year making 30% more in annual sales than we have ever did um, in the, the years prior to this. So this was literally at, we're at our top, you know, as far as sales and execution was. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. Right. Yeah. Incredible. So then clearly the world changes. Mm -hmm. And before we talk about the pivot, okay. right, because this is I think what's unique about the time and day that we live in is that we're all experiencing the same thing, yep. but we're experiencing it differently. So walk us through you know, a, a real moment of re reflection for you during this, this, this time, like what really, what, what, what was, what was your lowest moment as a business owner? Take us to that, that exact moment. Yeah. So once I, so it started to hit me when I was in Dallas, um, because it was, when you're not at home, you don't have the, the security and the certainty of what's going on. Um, at, at your home base. And DC is my home base, even though we do events in Dallas and um, LA. And so I was, I started to get, you know, frantic. I started to figure, like, try to figure out what was going on with the markets that we're in. And so I was like, can I get on the earlier flight? Can I hurry up and get back home? And so once I finally did get back home, I started to really just hear from our vendors, our venues, uh, hear from our clients, um about what was going on and i didn't know like I, it was literally just boom right then and there trying to hurry up and figure out what to do what steps to take and honestly i went immediately through maybe a week or two just like in stillness and in shock and trying to figure out what is going on because it's not just me i have a team of four other people and it just was a ripple effect event after event was either canceled or postponed and so I was like, OK, what is going on? Anxiety, you know, struck depression and just trying to figure out what answers did I have? And I didn't have any answers. No one had answers. And so just going through that phase, it probably took me a good three weeks to just really um, get back to some sense of normalcy in myself um, as I was you know, going through all of this with my clients. OK, wow. So th so three weeks in that zone. Yeah. And, and, and you and you were you were at, you know, a low point. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so now walk us through how you began to figure out that you needed to pivot right. and what ultimately what was the pivot? Yeah. So what started what my indicator for telling me that I needed to pivot was one. 
we had probably about four corporate clients that canceled. They were like, you know, we canceled and we can't we can't do anything else. And so our business, we we have them on payment scale. So when they cancel, that means any payments that we haven't you know, received or any work that we haven't done isn't going to be paid for. And so we're talking about thousands of dollars that we normally get each month. And then I said, okay, well, we have social events. We have our wedding clients that we can fall back on and still work with them to sustain us, you know, for our, our, our monthly bills. But then the wedding started to cancel and then postpone. And so that was like, okay, well, we don't get, we're not having as much money as we normally have each month that's coming in. How are we going to pay these bills? And I was like, I have no idea. We have, we have five people that we have to pay for. I have no idea how we're going to pay company bills, operation costs, and all of this. So I have to figure out what else to do to get money into the system. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, uh, let me just ask you that, right? Because so th this is what I find to be fascinating about, about entrepreneurs, right? So I just want to understand your mindset. You have five people that you must figure out how to, you know, keep them compensated, right? Because they have families, they have uh, right. responsibilities. Why did you just not quit? Because 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 most of the time people when that when it hits, most of the time people say, you know what, we just can't do it. I'm sorry. y'all. Right. Why, right. why did you not quit? So the thing is, like, I have a competitive spirit. You know, I'm an army vet. And so every time a challenge comes, I like that is my adrenaline rush. I've never faced this type of challenge, but um, it forces me to, to keep going. But at the same time, I still had clients that did not cancel their events, that they still wanted events done we just had to push them back and so i couldn't just quit because then that means i will be quitting on them i will be quitting on their 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 families and and things like that so it, even if i wanted to quit i couldn't because i had a contract you know to say that i was there but I, that was never in my mind because if i quit what would i do you know I, it's not like i can quit and go and do something else this was this is my livelihood so i couldn't just give up on that okay i hear you so then tell us about micro events slash micro weddings yeah and how you got your ditty on right and so, <laughs> and, so I, and so i knew that you know i i read over the phases of how the government is going to reopen and thankfully we had that in place uh and so i said okay well i knew that we were going to be able to do smaller events i knew that you know thousand you know participants at an event was not going to happen anytime soon and so I already had been talking about micro events and talking about micro weddings well before this took place. It was just on a different uh, level for those events. And I said, well, why not see if we could still do at least micro events and micro weddings for anywhere between uh, two to about 15 people, especially for the weddings, because we still have plenty of weddings taking place and plenty of couples was like, well, what can we do? We want to get married. We don't care if we don't have a hundred or 250 people. Can we just do something that's really nice? That's not an elopement, but still nice enough that we can invite a handful of people. And I was like, you know what? We probably can, because when the government opens back up, they're not going to allow hundreds of people. They're going to allow a smaller level of people. And just like now, the mayor of DC just allowed us starting May 29th, to start holding events for 10 people. So all of those, you know, couples that have been asking about this, now we get a chance to actually do this and we can just roll it out versus starting from the ground up now and pushing it out. And the same thing with our, um, our micro events. If we've been doing the virtual concept of this now and a lot of our face-to-face -face, uh, events involve a lot of our corporate partners so they're excited about it but it's good that we started this initiative before today when um the mayor announced this yeah i i, I think you, you've said several things that i think that we need to really you know peek our ears up in interest but one is that the lockdown it, the lockdowns are now coming to an end yeah right so it's very important for us to all create strategies on how we're now going to adapt to this new economy because we're we're coming back, but right. it's going to look different. Uh, yeah. So 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 it's good. You're right that that you were prepared for this before. Oh. So so you know, Andrew, when you when you look at just the last like how, how long is how long have we been? Is this been like about ten weeks, nine weeks? It, 
I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even want to. I don't even want to think about it. <laughs> yeah, I, it feels like a couple of years, but yeah. So, so when you think about like this, just period, this last period, right of of lockdown. All right. What is the top lesson that you were taking away from this time? The top business lesson. So. So it's actually something that you have already taught, um, talked about, Paul, and that is having multiple streams of income. So, you know, we prepared for having enough money that would save us for, you know, a couple of months, but definitely not this long. Like, I feel like we're not going to get past this to where we were until maybe the end of this year, uh, next year. And so learning how to have multiple strings streams of income is really critical and, and streams that is within what we're doing already. And so I've now added another addition to our business, which is interior design, which we've been doing um, as far as decorating uh, offices and painting different types of walls and designs. And so I've already been doing design for events and weddings, but never really opened that up to doing uh, design work for just the general public. So having multiple streams of income and more ways to actually bring in income has been probably the biggest lesson that I've learned as far as diversifying how to bring in money. And I mean, yeah, that's, yeah. that's the biggest thing. Yeah. There you go. There you go. We, we yep. all need it. Uh, you know, I started by saying that we're all entrepreneurs. Yep. I, every, every bit of data shows that you no, know, if it's 2021, 2022, 2023, we're, we're all going to be freelancers. Yep. And if we're all freelancers, if we're all entrepreneurs, we must have multiple streams of income. Right. Um, so there you go. There you go. So Andrew, how can we support you? What, what can we do to all support you? So I think like our biggest thing now, I mean, we can't have tons and tons of people that are, <laughs> are at events. So right now, our biggest thing that we're pushing out is our micro wedding. So if you guys know anyone that is interested, especially in the DC, Maryland, Virginia area, that is interested in having their wedding this year or a small version of that before the bigger thing, definitely contact us. The link is right there. Uh, contact us, see what our micro wedding is about. Share it. You know, you guys can follow us all over uh, social media at Andrew Roby Events. You know, we're, we're all over there. All right. There he is. Andrew, thank you. A, thank you for inspiring the session. You're welcome. Because you did. So thank you for that. Also, thank you for being a part of the tribe, right? Everybody loves you. So when you <laughs> pop on the screen, you know, what's interesting is I always look at the, um, I always look at the, I watch every, I watch the episode on back on LinkedIn and back on Facebook every yeah. time. And one of the things that I look for, because you, you know, I love data. So I always look for in Facebook, what's really interesting is that they, they have this engagement graph. Have you guys ever seen that? That in, there's an engagement graph. So you could look across the whole hour or hour and a half and you could see at what moment everyone was highest and most engaged. I guarantee you the mo the second that you popped on <laughs> the screen, people were like, hey, there's Andrew. <laughs> Every engagement, I guarantee it. So oh, thank, you. thank you so much. Uh, everybody make sure that you support Andrew with what he's doing. I think it's genius. There he is, the ditty, the ditty of event. There he goes. All right, guys. So great, great story there. Like great story, epic story. He remixed it, right? And why? Because actually, let me just, I, I won't even belabor. I'll just say that I think that what you just saw there was demonstration of true leadership. If you look up leadership, leadership should be exactly what Andrew just described that he did, all right? So now coming next to the stage, coming next to the stage is someone who, I just met as a result of doing this session, but let me tell you how, how we connected. Is so I wanted to have a voice from the UK um, and I reached out to a friend of mine, Rodney Apia, who you may know Rodney was on either the first or second session that we did. He's a uh, VC here in, um, in the UK, but he also is the uh, managing partner for a group called Cornerstone Partners, and they invest in, in black businesses here in the UK. And so I reached out to Rodney. I was like, Rodney, I'm doing, I'm doing something on pivoting, and I really want to get, I really want you to recommend me someone who you believe represents the pivot, like the, the, art, the art of the pivot, right? Like they got to know like about the hustle. And within seconds, he was like, you, you got to talk to this guy, right? So 
And that was on a Sunday. I then spent time researching. I, I tried to, you know, I, you know, went to, to, to IG, went to Twitter. Um, but his story, I think, is really interesting. And I will just say this. His story of how he started his business, how he was like in this airport and he didn't have a business and someone asked him, does he do A, B and C? And he had, he, he had not done it, but he said, yeah, yeah, I could do that. And how within 24 hours, he literally created a team and started building a product and went back to that person at the airport that he met. And that person became a customer like this guy is true. He truly knows the hustle. And so it only makes sense that during this recession, he was able to pivot his business coming to you from the UK with the clearest video I've ever <laughs> seen in my life. This is my man, Nana Perra. What's up, man? Hey, how's it going, Paul? How you doing, man? Hey, man, I'm good. I'm good, man. It's, it's, it's actually just, honestly, it's just a blessing, like, just to be here. But how are you doing? Very well, man. Really well. Really excited to just, yeah, just chat and listen to what the, uh, what the audience has to say and, yeah, just help out. There you go. There you go. All right. So then... Let's get it cracking, right? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. What, what I'd love to begin with is paint the picture before COVID-19. What did your business look like, the team, mm -hmm. details about sales? Give us that whole landscape. Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, we basically used to build minimum viable products. And what that means is, for anyone that doesn't know, is to build the initial version of your product, your digital product, so that you can learn and test before kind of spending loads of money on the whole thing. So people used to come to us to, to do that. Um, we've been running for just under three years. Um, and basically, yeah, the reason people came to us was because we actually cared about what they were building being successful. So our whole goal was to strip down just to the necessary features. And that's what that's what we did. It was a team of uh, six of us. And um, we also uh, recently got investment actually in Cornerstone Partners to kind of scale this business at the end of last year. Oh my God, <laughs> this, is, this, this feels reminiscent of what Andrew just said. So it, it, it sounds like right before COVID hit, this is probably the height of your business. You had just received funding, you're yeah. on a high. Yeah, yeah, we're changing everything. We're investing in people. Um, our sales in comparison from year one to year two was 60% ahead. We were on track to do what we had to do. And then entrepreneurship happens, man. It just happens. <laughs> it just happens. All right, so, yeah. so, so take us to that moment when you mm -hmm. realized things are not right and, mm -hmm. and you need to make a change. Yeah, so I was actually in the office and um, I was actually about to have a meeting and I got to the office and the, the clients were there and they said, they're not, they're not letting us in, not sure why. Find out from the office that um, there was a potential case of COVID in the office, so they shut, shut the whole building down. So, and that was gonna be a, a pretty big meeting. And then over the next, kind of few days I started to notice contracts not you know not working out so or, or people just pausing their contracts and to the point where I was looking at the bank account refreshing it just like there's there's got to be a problem on the bank side here it can't be it can't be our stuff but that was a, a really low uh, a really low moment because um, you know as a leader I have to go to the team and say look this is the data this is what's going on you know there's a lot of uncertainty at this time as well because we're actually not sure how long this is going to go on for what's the long-term impact going to be and you kind of have to say to the team look this is the deal um and come up with a plan to, to figure this out yeah so 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 going back to the same question i asked andrew where mm -hmm. why did you decide to try to figure it out and mm -hmm. not just throw in the towel because i i truly mm -hmm. believe most folks are just throwing in the towel yeah yeah so my personality is one where um I love problem solving. I love challenges. I, I also feel as a duty as a leader, you know, you're bringing people on a journey with you. You know, they're not, they are here by choice, but they're here because they believe in what you're doing. Um, and you know, the nature of entrepreneurship is that there's an, there's going to be different hurdles at different points. This is another hurdle, and we've got the skill set as entrepreneurs to figure that stuff out. So for us, it's it's not an option. It's not an option for us. It's another hurdle, we get over it, that we know there's gonna be others in the future. It's just about you know having the resilience to go through and, and push through with that. Okay, so now you've made that determination, you mm -hmm. decided that you, that you are going to push through. Mm -hmm. how, how do you figure out what is the right pivot? Because mm -hmm. if you're building MVPs, I would imagine you could almost build anything. You're like, you're, you're building yeah. MVPs. So you could just build anything. So how do you determine the thing to start building? 
So it's all about data. So I'm a, I, I think it's very important to do things, you know, under, listen to your gut and understand it, but I'm a very, very data heavy person. So I had to look at the metrics, had to look at, you know, the, the contract metrics, had to look at the sales conversion metrics, had to look at the engagement metrics. Um, I had to look at what's going on outside as well. And when you look at the raw hard data, especially objectively, there gets to a point where you know that, you know, the definition of madness is just doing the same thing over and over again, uh, expecting a different result. We knew that wasn't an option for us, purely based on the severity of kind of the, the cancelling or the slowing down of the contracts and the increasing of the sales cycle over time. I had to look at the metrics and that was like, right, there's enough data here for me to understand that something different needs to happen. Okay. So so now you you saw the data, which by the way, I just entered like, it's all about data. You were mm -hmm. echoing what I was just talking about on Monday. It's mm -hmm. all about data, right? So, so I love this. So you looked at it and it told you, okay, you need to pivot. But, I, but I'm really curious to get into how did you make the calculation, right? Mm -hmm. It's like every entrepreneur is like, okay, you have to, ch you have to pivot, right? But yeah. do you go left or do you go right? How, yeah. how, how did you make that determination? Yeah. So, so the first thing is a lot of, there's a tendency, I guess, and a lot of entrepreneurs will probably feel like this, that there's a, a tendency to look inward, to look inside, to try and solve the problem. But actually what we did and what we thought was the most appropriate thing to do was to speak to our customers, past, present, and future. So basically I came up with the assumptions that I had about the business today that I currently run and the assumptions I have about how my customers are behaving. So then I created the question set, like literally I'm gonna interview you, I'm gonna ask you questions to actually understand what is it that is making you behave in the way that you are. And these are all qualitative data points, right? It might not be exact numbers, but they're qualitative data points. So I asked, so I, I literally spoke, my, my goal was to speak to 20, I ended up speaking to 80 past, present and potential customers to just understand, not with a view to sell to them, just to understand what is it that they're going through? Why are they making the decisions that they're going through? And again, I looked at that data, I, I crunched it, I looked for the themes and I understood very clearly there is a need that we are currently not fully servicing and that need in the light of COVID is is got has got to be the way to go. Man, man I, I want I want to just underscore what you just said. I think it's brilliant. It's simple, but I think brilliance comes from simplicity, mm -hmm. right? You just simply reached out to eighty of your customers, mm -hmm. and you were like, "What? What's? What? Where, where's the pain?" Mm -hmm. So that you could figure out how you can help to resolve the pain, all right? Correct. So in other words, so you built like a quick MVP. Yeah. Right there. <laughs> 100%. But all right, so now you did that survey, the 80 mm -hmm. people, you began to look at the data, right? And, mm -hmm. and identify where the pain is. Now walk us through the next step and then how you end up, and then walk us through the next step and then how you end up to where you are today. Yeah, sure. So, so we've got the data, we're looking at it. And what we're doing is we're looking for themes to understand what is the need. And what we found out very clearly was the reasons people were making decisions that they were from a business point of view was because they obviously there was uncertainty but ultimately it was because they weren't sure how their customers were reacting or they weren't actually sure what the needs are so that they can appropriately address them from their customers so for us going through those steps and just saying right if we give these people an understanding of who their customers are and why why they're behaving in the way that they are they're going to be able to pivot they're going to be able to actually take that data and make potentially even higher rev revenue generating businesses so the actual process was you know analyze the data use our ux researchers our business analysts talk to people and actually recognize that the need of your customer is the most important thing go and serve them understand their problem and create solutions around that and that is that's basically the steps we took yeah, and I and I I tell you what I'm going to put this back on. I just uh, put I saw uh, G mention this on Facebook. I I think this is exactly what you're saying mm -hmm. is you approached them to learn, and Correct. that's exactly what you did. And too many of us are approaching just for the sale or the quick sale, right? Mm -hmm. um, so now talk to us now about you know now that lockdowns are beginning to end all over the world. Now, what do you do? Do you maintain this path now, this pivot, or is this now another 
business line for you and you're going to continue making the MVPs. Where, where, where do you stand today? Mm. So where we stand today is that we're very much focusing on the understanding the customer needs, getting those customer insights. However, like I did, like I said before, I'm a data driven person. I don't necessarily make a decision today that is going to necessarily last forever when it comes to the mechanics of the business. I'm creating a situation where as long as I engage and I interact and I look at the data and learn, that's what we'll do. But in terms of what we do today to serve these customers, um, number one is that we provide customer insights by actually finding out who your target customer is based on your profile and literally dragging them in front of you so you can ask them what you need to ask. And it's 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 seemingly a quite an audacious kind of um, service, but literally that's what we do. If you need to speak to the head of talent at an organization, we will find that head of talent based on their experience, put them in front of you, and you ask them questions to help you get customer insights. Yeah. We also create questions to help you actually make sure you're asking the right questions to get that data. And then we help you with the analysis of that data to make sure you not you don't feel like you're shooting in the dark, you're actually using that data to make better decisions for your business. And for us, that's the way we wanna go. Okay, we love it, we love it. Uh, I, I I think we're gonna call you, you know what we're gonna call you? Uh oh, I don't know, hope it's good. Man, <laughs> I, I have a name for everybody. All right guys, tell, tell, tell me how you like this name. I think you are the Yoda. <laughs> the Yoda of data. Damn, I'll data take it, I'll take data. it. You like that one? <laughs> I do, man, I'm definitely putting that on my profile. In this All right. All right, Andrew Roby, he, he, he's the he's the Diddy of events. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are the Yoda of data. All right, so uh, you've, you've already dropped a lot of gems on us, but when you now reflect back over the last few weeks, mm -hmm. what's the top business lesson for you, right? The, the one mm -hmm. lesson that when you look back a couple of years from now, you're gonna say, I'm thankful I learned that. Um, it's definitely gotta be around the team. And what I mean by that is, as I said before, uh, bringing the team with you, engaging with you, making sure that you know you're assisting them and helping them realize their visions in the in the workplace. But also, I have a really strong view based on the fact that this team has been together for so long. I mean, not not in terms of many years, but you know, in terms of intensity. Um, what I realize is that the team that stays together, learns together, wins together, fails together is it. It just helps so much when you're trying to get over barriers. So my, my main lesson is do what, I believe I have the right team, right? So do what I can to make sure that this team stays together and be open with them and tell them that, you know, we're here for the long haul. And I think just making sure that I follow through with that because we wouldn't have been able to pivot as quickly as we did without the team in the background, making the sacrifices, putting in the hours to be able to do that. Yeah, there you go. I love it. I love it. And also my man Paris right here said something, Nana, that I think you should you should just put this on all business cards on your LinkedIn right here. Just go ahead and throw it on right now. Like that's what you should do. Yeah, I'm yeah. You. I'm, I'm next level for you. Free marketing, man. Love it. <laughs> branding. I'm all about branding. Exactly. Um, but all right. So um thank you. Thank no, you. Like, you, you. You kind of echoed many things that we've talked about over multiple sessions, but you did it in just one hit. Uh, nice. So that was beautiful. How can we support you? What can we do to, to, to step up to the plate for you? Yeah, yeah. So so one thing that we did really, especially for uh, for this session is um, we I created the questions or myself and the team created the questions that we asked um, to our customers. And we wanted to basically share that. So if you uh, jump on a link, that will be shared. If you want the question set that we went to ask our customers to actually understand, is what we're doing still a problem? What are their priorities? How much should I charge for my service? All those kind of things. And you can jump on that link. And if it's of interest, please go ahead, uh, take the questions. But I, I just love talking to entrepreneurs, helping entrepreneurs if I can. So reach out to us on, on Instagram at Tectonic London um, or just drop me a LinkedIn, Nana Parry. I'm always happy to, to have a chat. Yeah. And I, I think everyone should go to this link. Every entrepreneur. I went to it uh, real quick but when you sent it over to me and I looked, I, I, I thought, oh, my God, like every every entrepreneur, I think, should just look at that. That should be a part of if there was a Bible for entrepreneurs, that would be a page. You know, yeah, and, yeah, uh, so it, it, uh, that, so that's brilliant. Uh, I tell you what, Nana, the Yoda of data. 
Thank you very much. I feel like I now have to bow to you. Thank yeah. you. Very much. <laughs> we, we appreciate it. I know everyone's going to reach out and, and support you on that link. Keep going, keep pivoting, and keep staying in that data. Amazing. Cheers. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Cheers. Yeah. All right. So there he goes. The Yoda of data, y'all. Check this link out, by the way. I, I thought the questions were impressive. And as you can see, uh, Nana is someone who probably dreams about questions and <laughs> dreams about data. So you know he'll have the right questions for you. So make sure you check out that link. All right. Temperature check. How we feeling, guys? How we feeling right now? I'm feeling good. And we're not even halfway done. All right. Coming to the stage. Next up is a dear friend of mine, a dear, dear friend of mine, who I don't know how long I've known, but I feel like I've known her for for for, uh, for close to a decade, right? But we was, yeah, I met her when she was 10, right? I met her when she was 10. But I feel like I met her, I believe I met her before she was full-time on her business. Um, and then she went full-time. She really is a bit like Andrew in a way where um, I think she kind of remixed what she was doing because she was not a wedding planner, but focused on wedding coordination, which I'm sure she'll talk to us about in a, in a bit. But what I loved about her story then was that she, I like, I, I mean, it's like, it's like, you know, seeing somebody grow up before your eyes, right? And she, her business grew, the number of events that she was doing grew from five to 10 to 15 to 20, right? She started bringing on multiple people. I saw ge geographically, she started doing events in multiple states. She was just growing and growing and growing. And then this freaking COVID-19 hits. And you'll hear how she pivoted her business. Her name, by the way, is Carla Friday. Do you know what date is? Does anybody know what date is? Today's Friday. So we have, ladies and gentlemen, we have Carla Friday, not on a Monday, not on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or a Saturday or a Sunday. We have Carla Friday on a Friday. Yes! <laughs> what, better, what better day to have me than a Friday? Right? You got to Friday on Friday right now. <laughs> there should only be one day that you show up and do events, only on Fridays. I, I only do events on Friday, actually. You caught okay. me. <laughs> <laughs> or, or interviews, only on Friday. Right, right, right. How's <laughs> it, Paul? You know what? Things are good. Things are good. I'm I'm inspired already. Andrew and Nana, or should I say the, um, the Diddy of Events and uh, uh, the Yoda of Data have me, have me inspired. Right, me too. And I'm a huge fan of Andrew. So yeah. good yeah. way to kick this off. Yeah. All right. So then tell us about it. Right. You, you, I think things were good for you right before COVID-19 hit. Break down how good things were for you and what your business was doing. Yeah. Um, things were really great with Details Made Simple. The coordination business was thriving. We were set to have the biggest year yet. Uh, this is actually our ninth year in business. And I was excited. I mean, we had a ton of weddings on the calendar. Um, when this hit, we were kind of right around the time where we were gonna start hitting the ground running with our season in March. And um, I actually did a wedding the week it all broke out. Um, but yeah, we were we were doing really well. We had the biggest team we've had yet. Uh, I have a team of 13. Uh, we were ready to hit the ground running and then COVID hit. And what can I say? Everything just halted. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so talk to us about, you know, the, really the, the deepest moment, because I keep thinking to myself, there, there's, there's lots of different businesses that have obviously been impacted. Right. Right. But when you, when I think about events, I think, my God, legally, we could not come together. And I think, so a legally, we can't come together. And then secondly, people now have less income essentially, or less disposable income. So therefore they'll want to cut back on the events, cut back on the weddings. So, so walk us through the moment that this all hit you. I mean, what were you feeling? What were you thinking? And then clearly, what did you do? Yeah. So I actually, my last wedding that I actually did um, was on March 14th. And that was kind of the week it, it really like broke out on the news and people started to get scared. And that wedding had to happen anyway. I mean, there was really nothing we can do. It was only a few days prior that it actually happened. And it hit me at the moment that the wedding, the, 
the day I was doing the wedding when 65 people didn't show up. They were scared. Um, and then, you know, we got put on lockdown and we couldn't leave our home. And I was like, oh my gosh, we got a flood of emails of postponements. I mean, 80% of our year has moved hands down 80%. That's about 70 weddings or so have all moved. And it, it's, it's devastating. Um, there's not much we can do. I'm, I'm here in New Jersey. The bulk of the weddings that we do are in New Jersey and New Jersey is the second hardest hit state. So for us, we're just kind of sitting here waiting um, to get some direction on when we can kind of get back up and running. And it's, it's pretty devastating to see the magnitude of what's going on um, in the business, but also dealing with our clients. And it's, yeah. I'm heartbroken for them. Yeah. So, so I would imagine so that the clients are canceled or they canceled, postponed, right? I think you said, was that 80% that you just mentioned? Yeah, 80% have actually moved. So we um, moved about 70 weddings. The majority of them moved to like next year. Um, but it wasn't just the ones that were coming up. Um, the ones that were a week or two or three weeks out or even two months out. We've had weddings all year, September, October, November, August, all move for various reasons. It could be because the venues, like we just simply can't have events. Uh, right. The venues are closed. They lost their job. They don't have the means to pay for their wedding now. So they're pushing it. Um, some even have guests that were traveling in and straight up said they're not coming to New Jersey in the fall. Yeah. It's probably going to be back. We don't have a vaccine. They don't feel comfortable. Yeah. So we we have to figure something else out by moving everything. We've had a few cancellations of people that just decided they're not getting married anymore. Yeah. But yeah. You know, it's interesting for, for me. Um, so, so being here in London, there was a, the week before uh, the prime minister had, uh, and, and really the queen came out and said, okay, we're on lockdown. Right. I was scheduled to go to a wedding. I was going to, I was actually preparing to leave to, to, to go to a wedding and they were like, no, and then, you know, the venue canceled. Sure. Um, and, and what was interesting is that the couple, they went and they figured out a way just to make it happen. Right. Yeah. And, and, and to me, what that said is I, I, I started to think about you and, you know, Andrew and all my friends in the wedding space, especially I have a lot of friends in Jamaica who do weddings in Jamaica. Yeah. And I thought, oh my God, will 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 this now shift? how people perceive weddings. I feel like we were we were looking at a place where everyone wanted a big, massive hundred, like they wanted a Nigerian wedding where <laughs> 5,000 people show up for like a week, you know? And I was thinking, my God, this will fundamentally change how the size of, 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 our, of our weddings. But the question though that I wanna ask you is, all right, so no more weddings. You had to move it pretty much all. How do you determine what to do? Did did you did you use the king of I'm um, the king? But did you use Yoda, the Yoda of data strategy, or what? How did you determine that you had to pivot, and then ultimately what did you pivot to? So aside from pivoting, you know, obviously trying to make sure our clients are taken care of, we had to pivot with kind of halting the coordination and providing coordination with helping them postpone and making that stress-free and kind of reaching out to vendors and helping them navigate moving this important day for them. But once that was over, because in the beginning we got an influx of emails. I mean, it was like every hour or every time the governor talked, we would get another email about a postponement or whatever. Um, but the increase stopped coming, the money stopped coming, everything just halted. So I was like, okay, I can't do weddings till God knows when. Um, we aren't bringing any income in, you know, nobody's spending money on anything but necessities. What else can I do? And I do have another company um, called The Simple Shop. And it's kind of like a spinoff of Details Made Simple. We um, customize and personalize different types of wedding decor. So, you know, champagne flutes, robes, all the things that, you know, couples use on their wedding day that have their date or name on it. And we also do candle favors. Um, I also do a lot of candles uh, for small businesses as like, you know, swag um, and promo. So I thought, you know, I can't leave the house. Let me go to the shop and bring all the equipment back that I need to produce candles and let me make stuff. If I can't serve people, I can definitely make things. So I launched our first official candle line for the simple shop. It's non wedding related, but it was a way for me to pivot and come up with a website. Um, I learned Shopify in a week and got a website up and created very beautiful packaging. And I did a give back component with it where 
if you purchase a candle, all the proceeds, um, sorry, 15% of the proceeds that come from the website are being donated to directrelief.org, which is an amazing charity that is supporting people on the front line with PPE. And believe it or not, what, two months later, it's still in dire need. So this pivot was a way for me to stay sane, um, you know, in the house by myself, not being able to do weddings, but also give back and spread some joy um, for people that are in the house by themselves too. You know, lighting a candle can make, set the mood. Um, you can send a candle to somebody on the front lines or maybe, you know, your mom for Mother's Day, we weren't able to celebrate with people. So I created a way to basically do that. Yeah. You know, Carla, how, how did you, you know, getting getting into the that decision, right? Um, how did you how did you know it was candles, right? Versus versus something else? Because I think there are a lot of people watching who maybe have five different options that they're thinking of, mm -hmm. or three different options. You pick candles. Why? What was it about candles that 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 told you that was the right pivot for you? For me, it's one of the passions that I have. So I always feel like you should always do what you're passionate about. Um, and you know, something you could be authentic with when talking about and backing behind it. So for me, I was like, everybody loves our candles. You know, we've been making them for so long for the wedding space and the small business space. Why not just finally launch something? I, I was supposed to get our Etsy shop up for the wedding side of the business, but I was so busy with weddings, I never got to do it. So I was like, now I have this time, I can actually get this website up, um, which is how the simpleshop.com came about. But for me, it was really the easiest, quickest thing that I can do um, that I knew how to do well. Yeah. And who doesn't love a candle? I mean, there's lots of candle companies out there um, with you know different themes and everything. And it was just it was just an easy um, progression for me to do. Yeah. I also what I like about it too is that uh, you know they're quote unquote affordable, right? Oh. It's, it's not like you're out here selling Bentleys. You know what I mean? Like who who wants a Bentley? Like really, you think about it now. <laughs> Who wants, anytime you see somebody having a Bentley now? Right. You're like, why? why? You know? Candles. So, so, and then the other part too that I think should not be forgotten is people are buying the candles, oh, right? So, so, so you're getting, you're getting sales. People are buying, we're getting sales. I mean, it's obviously not on the magnitude of Details Made Simple and the sales that we're used to getting with the wedding business, but I... I almost cried when all these orders came in. It was, it was crazy. And now I, at first it was a lot of friends and family and, you know, people that I know supporting. And um, then it became people I don't even know. And then I saw people using the gifting feature. Like I have this area on the website where you, when you purchase a candle that you're going to send to somebody, you can type in a note that I'm going to handwrite and put in the box. So the person that you're sending it to know, knows it came from you. So I started to see these notes come in of people sending candles to a nurse on the front line or their mom just saying like, I hope we can get together soon. And here's a little something to get you by. And that just really warmed my heart because that was the whole point um, to spread joy, to give hope, um, to inspire other entrepreneurs to do the same, like find out what you're passionate about and see how we could make that happen during this pandemic and, yeah. and pivot that way. I love it. I love it. So so now when you think back to the last couple of weeks, right, what's that top business lesson that you'll just simply never forget? Uh, I would say staying still is not the thing to do. Um, it, it took a while, just kind of like what Andrew was saying, like he was still for like two weeks until it kind of hit him and he tried to figure it out. And that's exactly what I did. I kind of had that like come to Jesus moment. I was like, I have to do something because sitting here and just waiting for this to pass, I'm going to be homeless. Like we're all going to have no job. So just, you know, I think the single biggest lesson is to move and to capitalize on those different passions that you have. Now is the time. Um, I think a lot of new businesses or entrepreneurs are going to be birthed from this pandemic. I think if, you know, current entrepreneurs had another idea that they've always wanted to do, now is the time to get in on it. Everything is digital. People are online buying, especially if they know they're helping contribute to a give back or a charity, or um, it's not just them spending a ton of money for no reason. So, I mean, you, you just have to just do, you have to move, you have to, you have to pivot. There you go. You know what, Carla, I tell you what, this this entire time, right, that we were talking, I'm listening to you, but I'm also thinking, 
what is Carla's nickname, right? <laughs> because, you know, with, with, with Andrew, it came to me before he even came right. on, right? You know, with, with, with Nana, it took a little bit, right? And then halfway through, I got it. Your nickname didn't hit me until this final question. And when you said, keep moving, you got to keep moving. And I opened with the, the importance of a shark always moving, get that oxygen. <laughs> I now give you Carla, the shark. Okay. Right the I shark. The shark right here, guys. This is the okay. shark, right? You got to keep moving, guys. Keep moving. <laughs> Keep moving. I tell you what, I, I think I think your story is, is powerful, Carla, because you. you represent most business, right? Where you literally created like your business was a pivot, but you really created an entirely new business, different customers, different go to market strategy, completely yeah. different business. And you did it in a week. Yeah. Right? yeah, A little over a week, you know. Yeah. And it, it, it shows you the shark in you because you keep you. moving always. I'm proud of you. I'm very proud of you. Keep doing your thing. We love you. How love can you. we all support you? How can we support um, you? Hey, you can support the simple uh, I know he's going to put the link on the screen. It's uh, the simple shop, S H O P P E. If you want to check out the site, maybe buy yourself some candles, send it to somebody on the front lines. Um, on the wedding side of stuff, like, hey, if you have somebody that is kind of stressed out about what to do, you know, we're happy to chat with them, help them, you know, reset their wedding if they need, um, you know, just kind of be that voice of reason to talk to because we've kind of been that for a lot of people. And on the business side, like, hey, if I can help with anything, if anybody wants to pick my brain or if I can talk to you about pivoting or um, anything, I'm absolutely able to support everybody out there as well. There you go. Love it. I tell you what, I'm seeing comments of people saying how you just spoke to their heart. Uh, so so, so th thank you very much, Carla, for, for inspiring. Keep moving. Keep, keep moving. moving. Just keep moving. <laughs> keep moving. All right, Carla, I will see you. Everybody say goodbye to Carla. There she goes. The shark, y'all. The shark. She's moving. Right. She will always survive. She will always survive. You know, by the way, I, when, when Carla was talking, I was thinking, wow, Carla always survives. What always survives? And I was thinking, well, roaches always survive. <laughs> but then I thought <laughs> it's probably not nice to call anybody a roach. Like you don't want to be Carla the Roach Friday. Like that's that's not a good look. But a shark. That's a good look. That's a good look. All right. Let's keep it moving. Let's keep it moving, y'all. Next, come into this, come into the stage, come to the stage. This is a special one, right? Everybody's special, but this is a special one because this is someone who was going to come on a previous session, a previous uh, Better With Paul. And I, I, I went and I was like, uh, watch, I went to, to YouTube and I was watching, you know, his YouTube, watching his videos. And I thought, my God, like his story, is so rich and so powerful. And it really is a story, I believe, of a, a whole career of pivots. I thought, nah, like he, he, that was not the right session. Today is the right session. Um, and then also, I think what's really interesting uh, about our next guest is that I think he represents the, like we're all, I, I feel like we're all creators or all wanna be creators, but he is a creator through and through. I mean, magical musician, magical voice. I didn't realize he had such a great voice since I checked out his Instagram, but magical voice. We should get him to sing, by the way, uh, but magical voice, but just, just magical creator. And in this day and age, man, I would imagine in this recession, it's incredibly hard to be a creator, right? But maybe I'm wrong, but let's find out. This is my man, Lee England Jr. There he goes. There he goes. <laughs> hey man, you, you know you know what's crazy. I was, I was like, we got to get him. Honestly, you could blow. Like you, you could play, but you could sing. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. That's a that's a pivot in itself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So 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 break down like as a creator, man. Before COVID hit, what did life look like, right? Because 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 I you know on on the gram, your life looks look glorious. <laughs> it looked glorious. I saw you playing at Swiss Beats 40th birthday, like on the yacht. I was like, 
his life looks really good. Oh, what yeah. was life like before COVID? So before COVID, um, I was much like uh, 80% of the other musicians who um, are used to doing live performances. So I spent the majority of my time um, creating shows, uh, putting shows together, getting booked for shows. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, it was pretty much me, my manager, and a small team of people who were really just doing what every other musician, musician does, and that's you know curate live performances. Yeah, yeah. So live performances, man, as you said, like that's bread and, and butter for musicians. Mm -hmm. So walk us through to that moment, or walk us back to the moment where you realized Dang, live performances aren't gonna be happening <laughs> anytime soon. What were you feeling? What were you thinking? Um, well, I mean, that's like a, oh my goodness, that's like taking paintbrushes from Picasso or something. Um, but, uh, you know, the moment that I realized that uh, everything was about to, to kind of uh, just switch up and change uh, was when, uh, you know, we all got quarantined. So I had gigs that were already booked. I had deposits that were already uh, sent in. Um, and so it was, you know, like devastating to know that, you know, something that I love the most, which is being in front of people and creating community uh, was going to be dismantled for a little bit. Yeah. yeah. So so now I'm, I'm just curious, though, because I saw that there was a it felt like there was a big festival movement and big, like big concerts, big festivals prior to COVID. Everything seemed to be getting bigger. Mm -hmm. What what do you see as the future of musical events? Will we get back to those big festivals or or, or will we not? Will it change forever? Um, well, my hopes is that we get back to, you know, having big festivals yeah. um, because I had literally just developed a model for how I was going to distribute my new project. Um, I had saw uh, like a real niche in how to like garner fans and then like create like this um, almost like an exponential growth. Um, and just because I, I've been on stage for so long that I really know what to do on stage. And so yeah. now with, you know, creating my own music, it was like, all right, you know, I, I got to figure it out. So I'm hoping that, it, you know, it, it definitely goes back to that. Um, but if it doesn't, I am really starting to see that there's got to be a way to put on like event level live streams. Yeah. Because I, I see people doing live streams and it's always like, you know, it's shaky. Yeah. You know, it's a very, it's a very new uh, platform for a lot of us. And so trying to figure out how to have the crispness of the sound and, you know, the, the beautiful shots and the set design and all that kind of things. Like I've always said uh, that you can do concerts from home, but I never pivoted into doing that. You know? Yeah, there you go. Have you seen what uh, Erica Badu is doing with her at homes? Uh, or not, I shouldn't say at home, but her live streams? Um, I saw a little bit of it after the versus battle that she did with Jill Scott. Okay. Yeah. Cause, cause I, 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 I like, at least I like, um, cause, cause what you're saying is, is so true. It's like there, it should be higher quality. And I felt like she had nice crisp camera angles. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, but yeah, I, I, I thought that was good. So now you're at a, a, a spot where, okay, we don't know what events will look like when they come back. Right. right. So man, what, what is your pivot as a creator? What, what, what do you do? So um, my pivot has always been back to the product. Um, and if, uh, as a musician, my number one product is me being live, but that's not, that's not, that hasn't always been my bread and butter. Uh, my bread and butter has actually been from like the merchandise of it all. So now, instead of worrying about um, where I need to be, I'm actually looking more at uh, the product and um, it's given me an opportunity to actually expand. Um, I was already working on a CD that was going to be, um, you know, it's, it's going to be huge. Um, but I had to step back and look at a different way to distribute it. So I have a, a very novel idea. I can't give it away right now um, because it's so fresh uh, and I don't want anybody steal my idea. But um, I have, uh, there are other things that I really enjoy doing. Like I enjoy writing. Um, and I enjoy like making music. So as far as creating works, it's not that difficult because everyone has in-home studios now. 
So I don't have to gather a whole bunch of musicians. I can just, you know, send out the track, get it back, get it published, get it copyrighted, get everything ready for it. So when it is time to release, um, it can be a lot of fanfare because the streaming services right now are, you know, they're doing they're doing well. But yeah. I, I, I kind of see that I don't want to put all of my I want to know where like my fans and where people are actually coming to as far as where my music is distributed. So instead of looking to all of these streaming platforms, uh, I'm creating my own. There you go. That, um, man, can I tell you this? When, when, uh, who, who was it? Y'all know uh, when uh, the, the verses with, uh, uh, with Teddy Riley and Babyface, right? The moment that that happened, I immediately said, Man, Timberland and Swizz, they must do their own platform. Like mm. they've got like they they need their own platform. And, right. and ever since then, I've been preaching, you need your own platform. It's man, it's a blessing to see. That's what you're doing. That's what hey, you're that's doing. A, that's the perfect thing to do because there's there's no other way to really corner what's going on with streams because you know, these like I have a friend, I wanted to buy their music. They're like, it's on Apple Music. I go on Apple Music, I download it to my phone, and I'm like, so how do I give you money? And they're just like we don't know. <laughs> I'm like, so how am I actually supporting you? You know, and it's like I'm actually looking more so to be very, um, be very like poignant with the people who actually want to support me. It's like I don't need the entire world. I need the one. I don't need the people who actually care for what it is that I'm doing. And I want to, uh, like Tyler Perry said, I want to super serve my niche. There you go. All right. You know, it's interesting in the in the comments here. I saw this pop up twice. Um, this is this is man. I think this is the biggest kudos you could get. I saw this Prince vibes. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, I, gotta, I gotta tell you, right? So uh, I started reading, and that was, that's another thing that I kind of pivoted into was yeah. like more into like my own development, making sure you know my own confidence, my own vulnerability, my own sharing, all those things. And I started to say, who in the world has been through some of the things that I've been through? And so I was like. Prince was the first one on my mind, like Prince, Prince, wow. Prince. So I started reading his book, uh, Beautiful Ones. And the one thing that stood out to me was that, uh, and that I wanna actually share is that Prince didn't have a will. Yeah. So he passed and it was like all of, for him to be such a person that said, you know, own your masters and, you know, you would think that he would have everything in order. And so that kind of started me on a, another little path to actually see that, you know, that's a very important thing, especially in our community is to, you know, if you want to build generational wealth and such, like you need to know about how money works yeah, you know, and how wills and trusts and all those kind of things work. So, man, amen, amen. I think Aretha Franklin, I think didn't have one. I think James Brown, his situation was, was shaky. I completely yeah. agree, completely agree. Well, I, I tell you what, the question of, of singing, this is how I know you could sing for real. A, I've heard you sing, but second, when I said he could sing, he was like, yeah. <laughs> That's how you know, you can just kill it. So I tell you what, Lee, I know you're going to come back mm -hmm. and you're going to bless everybody with a little quick little performance for us all. Yeah, so yeah, everybody yeah. stay tuned who wanted to see the Prince vibes. That's our special <laughs> for us right there. So Lee, thank you very much. All right. Lee is we'll be right back with a little performance for us all. So for us all a little network a little bit uh, in the comments. Uh, let's keep it going. We have two more guests, two more guests. By the way, Lee's nickname is clearly Prince. Like clearly, like I saw the Prince vibes already. I think he's got purple on already. Like he's definitely he's got the Prince vibes. So we can call him Prince, right? Lee England Prince Jr., right? Prince Jr., that's what we're gonna call him. All right, so next up is someone who I uh, I met through a, 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 a like a virtual conference that I was speaking at. Uh, oh, you'll probably remember when I was going to speak to, to the Jamaican embassy and I was running late, right? So the group I was speaking to at the Jamaican embassy were a group of women in Jamaica who are entrepreneurs. And one of the uh, ladies in this group, what I found really interesting about her is that she's an optometrist, but yet what, she, you know, she was an optometrist who would actually go into the field with clients and she couldn't do that anymore as a result of, you know, social distancing. So she pivoted to start creating PPE. And she, I believe she invested a significant amount of her money into this. So it was already a gamble to pivot. And then I feel like she took, 
you know, the, the resources that she kind of had left. And then she doubled down and invested in this new pivot. And you'll see how this pivot has worked out for her. I'm really proud of her. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, from Jamaica. So from Jamaica, you know we need to see some applause going on. From Jamaica, here's my sis right now, Mayana Francis. There she is. There she is. Hold on. Let me get her unmuted. Uh-oh, sis. Uh-oh. Oh, there hi. She is. <laughs> hi, hey, everybody. Hey there. Hey there. Hi, Paul. How are you doing? How, how's everything? I'm good, thank you. I'm actually at work at the hospital right now. Um, you know, because I, I do that. Oh, and wow. as you said before, you know, comprehensive eye care is a eye care business, but we go out in the community to provide eye screening. We work along with churches, along with schools. And so as a result of COVID-19, we were no longer able to do that. I really tried to pay my staff um, during that time because um, five of them were females with children. And I really wanted to keep them with an income during this time. Okay. And so I remember sitting with them and saying, you know, guys, I don't know if we can do this for me. You know, something's got to have to give. So we've got to find a way. Mm. And we did. All right. So, 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 so break it down. What was the way? How did, how did you determine how to pivot and what is that new way? So actually... Um, most of my staff live in a particular part of the island called St. Catherine. And the government had closed down that um, area because of the number of cases at the time. And uh, I said to them, listen, we're going to keep calling our clients or patients. We're going to keep contact with them. Just make sure they're okay. Just make sure that they're doing well and keep the contact going. So one of our stakeholders, actually, a person from a church, had asked about a thermometer if we knew where to find one. I did not at the time. So I, um, I said, no, but I will think about it. Because one of the things is I am really good at researching, really good at researching items. So I did some research, I found the product, and then I did some further research because the same client called back and said, you know, have you found a thermometer? Because now we need five. So I said, you know, I think there's an opportunity in here and I'm going to get on it. Okay, so, now, so tell, tell me about this is that I know you, you invested... And, and I don't want to make the story out to seem like it's something it wasn't, but I, I feel like you invested the last bit of your resources into this new project. So, so talk about the risk that, that you were exactly. putting in the game right now. Exactly. So what happened was I had some money available that I would use to pay bills. In fact, um, I worked it out in U.S. dollars because I know most people would be able to understand that pretty well so that would be about 1600 us dollars and basically that's all i had my salary plus some extra money and i said you know what i'm getting these items and i'm selling it because we have to do this and interestingly when i checked and that was on the 26th of april and i remember because one of my rentals was due at that time and i said you know um, i just need some time give me a week give me a week yeah. and so um i got the week extension and i did the same for my other bills as well and then at the 19th of may when i ran the accounts through the invoices that i created with my little invoice thing on my um, phone i had made a total in of twenty thousand us dollars of, tw of tw twenty thousand Twenty-four thousand US dollars. Twenty-four. And, and how long, man? How many? How many weeks? So that was the the twenty the twenty-sixth of April to the nineteenth of May. So that's about three weeks. Three weeks. Now let me ask you: How much was your revenue last year? Your in your your total revenue last year in US. Okay, for for that month. Yeah, yeah, or, or even total, total US. Okay, okay, so I'm going to work it out in US dollars for you, okay? Okay, so because everything, that, everything you know, 
Here, so to the doctor, I don't know. By the way, this is what I love about your so baby. It was thirteen thirteen thousand eight hundred dollars, and so it means that I would have surpassed my revenue for last year for that month. Um, yes. They're about equivalent, so I would yes. have surpassed that. So just as a side note, this is what I can say, what I say, what I, I love about Jamaica, in particular, Jamaican women, right, is that you are on with us. You are speaking into a mic, but yet the woman behind you is louder than you. <laughs> I can hear I'm her. I'm sorry about that. Really? I'm at work. <laughs> yeah, but no, no, no. I, I love it, though. I love it. I'm just saying that's, that's what I love. It's like it's like she I can hear her. But now let's go back to the story because I want to break this down. So with so three weeks ago or now technically four, because that was a week ago. So four weeks ago, you didn't know how you were going to pay the salary for your five workers. Your business Correct. was frozen because of the recession. You didn't Correct. know. So we had to close. You had to close, you closed. Yes. And then yes. you came up with it with an idea. You took the equivalent of a thousand US. That was the last amount of money, the last yes. amount of money, you invested yes. in your pivot, and three weeks later, you've made twenty four thousand US more than you made last year. Correct. It would work out to uh, seven and three, uh, eleven thousand US more. My honor. This is this is what I'll say. I li like yes. you li deliver real like yeah. I like how cool yes. you are with it. I like how cool you are with it. But 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 tell us this though. Tell us this because I know you're you're, you're at work. So I'm, so I'm not going to hold you. One last question. I think your story is incredible. I think it is incredible. Thank you. Thank you. My question though to you is, what is your lesson? What's the takeaway? What do you want to share with everyone about what you have gone through? But what everyone should understand about what you went through. Um, you know the, the two things about it. The first thing is that. You know, there's always a way. And no matter how small you think what you have, you can make it. Because I remember my first order for 50 items. I could not purchase all 50 items. So I told the customer that, you know, we only have 25 right now. So I'm going to give you the 25. And then on Monday, because that was a Friday, and then on Monday, I'll give you the 25. When in truth and in fact, I would need to collect that money to go and purchase the additional 25 in order to make that sale of the 50 items, you know, but I found a way to make it happen. And I heard Carla say um, on, uh, earlier to keep going, keep going because every day I'm keeping going and I'm turning that money on a daily basis. But what has been really um, tremendous is the support through networking because I'm a part of the um all program which is the academy of women's entrepreneur program and so we have a network there are people i can reach out to really quickly for a quick tip or a quick um information and also um get to that place i'm also a part of the young entrepreneurs association of jamaica of which i'm the vice president and through that network, I was also able not only to make sales, but to also call on other persons to assist me with information, with advice, with where to go. And so I find that the networking, it paid off. Also, in um, my primary um, business or area of business, I realized that the fact that we kept data mm -hmm. We have data on all our clients. If we go in the community, we collect phone numbers, we, we, we collect names. So we have information on all the individuals. And so we were able to call up the churches, we were able to call up members of the community, different stakeholders, so that we could reach out to them and let them know that, listen, we have been working with you all this time. We have products that you can trust. And so there was no hesitation to really go ahead. So if you already have clients, you know, what is it that your clients need in this time? You know, what can you supply those persons that you already have? Because now we're actually targeting the schools. What do the schools need? You know, because they are also our clients. So persons who are already our clients, so so what can we there. supply them? What can we do for them? Because we have no, already no, been serving 
those persons. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and you know, I, I love this show as well because previously I, I, I'm not so much social media savvy and all of those things, but let me tell you something. Throughout this time, I have learned so much because in okay. fact, I think more than uh, half, about maybe 65% of the sales came from online, from Instagram. Mm. Mm. So I I learned how to use Canva and design some flyers. I put them on Instagram. I uh, boosted them for just a little bit of money, um, like uh, $1 per day for five days, $2 per day for five <laughs> days. <laughs> I, I kid you not. I kid you not. There but you I go. think what made the difference is that you know, we found a product or a few products that were in demand. And then I have great research skills. So the skill that I have is research. So I was able to research and find those products yeah, and then yeah. bring them to the consumer. Yeah. So yeah. the networking, the collecting of the database and the use, use of resources that is available to you, especially those that are free or of minimal cost. Yeah. And then on top of that is just your mindset. I mean, always going. And by the way, Mayana, I've been giving everyone nicknames, right? So, you know, Lee is the prince. We got Andrew, right, is, is, the, is the ditty of events. We've got Carla, who is the shark Friday. And of course, Nana is the, the, the Yoda of data. Now, I've seen in the comments a lot of people echoing an idea that I had for your name. And that is, is you are clearly the gardener. You're the gardener. That's what you're the gardener because you are pouring, right? It's, it's the fact that you've poured into your team, the fact that you've poured into your network, the fact that you've poured into your clients, right? That's been able to result in where you are now. Uh, I think your story is powerful. It's inspirational. And I'm appreciative that you're part of just part of the community. So Maya, thank you very much. Now I want to say this, um, how, how, how can we support you? What's something that we can all do to support you? Can we go to a website? What, what is it that we can do? And I'll enter it. Well, we are on Instagram, you know, as Comprehensive Eyewear. We're on Facebook as Comprehensive Eyewear. So you could always like and follow my pages because um, that will give me some kind of momentum because previously, um, you know, we didn't do much of that. But now I see some traction in that and it is resulting in sales. So I'd really appreciate that. Is that is that the correct one? Comprehensive Correct. Okay. Wow. My spelling is all right today. My spelling is good, y'all. All right. So there you go. And if, if, if you want to make a, a personal connection with me, you could look for me, which is Mayana Francis on Instagram or on Facebook. Um, if you have a business idea that you want to discuss or you want to get it out there quickly, I'm willing to go through it with you. I think I'm really skilled at, you know, uh, identifying a product and getting it out there in the market really quickly. Okay. Especially if you have limited resources. So if you want to reach out for that purpose, you can do so as well. That, that's not a problem. All right, super. My, thank you very much. You're an all-star. Mm -hmm. You're an all-star. That okay. was good inspiration. Thank you. It was good great. Partner. Everybody say goodbye. Everybody say goodbye to Mona. There she goes. Man, that was inspirational. That was inspirational, y'all. All right. Last but not least, real quick, let me let me get a temperature check on how do you feel about the, the guests so far? How do you feel about the guests so far? All right. So as you're saying that, let, let, me, let me bring on our last guest. Now, I want to actually blame. That's right. I'm going to blame our last guest as the reason why you haven't received the ebook yet. And let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. So, you know, I've been working on this ebook over the last two weeks. I wanted to get it out this week. But you also know that at the end of all of these sessions, I go back and I watch them and I read the comments. So that will inform me about what guests and, and, and how to program the future, right? So the last session uh, that, that we just finished this week uh, on Monday, right? I then afterwards, I then got onto LinkedIn. And immediately as I got onto LinkedIn, my timeline, like the people I follow, it was blowing up with messages about Don Dixon, raising money, right? Like it was several, several, like Don Dixon raise, raises this money, Don Dixon does this. And I was like, Don Dixon, that name sounds familiar. Let me, you know, that guy. And so I then entered what I call the rabbit hole. Like we've all been on, on it, where you go read one article that then leads you to another article that leads you to a podcast that leads you to a video keynote. 
And I'm going to tell you what, I, within, you know, I, I probably, honestly, this is probably stalkerish. I probably spent, I don't even want to tell you how long I spent. I spent much longer than anybody should reading about someone because that's how fascinated I was. And at the end of reading, you know, watching, listening, et cetera, about all like her career, like I was all throughout her entire career. I said to myself, you know what? I, we, we already have five guests already, you know, for Friday, but she, this is the plat, like we need to hear from her. We need to hear from her. And so it was just, I just lobbed in a shot, right? I, I, I shot my, my, my shot um, and she responded back and she said, Paul, I'm there, I'm there. I will tell you this. Hands down, you've heard inspirational stories today. We hear inspirational stories all of the time in terms of entrepreneurship. I would easily give this top 1% of inspirational stories. And so, um, you know, all I got to say is she's the reason that you didn't get your ebook because I was too busy <laughs> reading, listening, and watching her incredible story, guys. This is none other. Then Dawn Dixon. There she is, everybody. Oh, thank there you. I uh, like getting stopped online, Paul. It's, <laughs> it's an honor. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna tell you the, the story was just dope from, from A to Z. From A to Z, it was. Uh, you. Man, you, you make know. me sound so good. I love that. Thank yeah. You. What 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 I, I tell you what, I think everyone who doesn't know who you are is about to understand why I went down that rabbit hole. Can you break down? Let's let's even go back beyond right before COVID, because yeah. I honestly think that 2018 time period for you was like it was a moment. That was COVID. That was, <laughs> that was COVID. That was a killer. It was a killer. So what yeah. what what did the business look like then? Right before the incident, what were you doing? What did the bu business look like? How big? Break it down for us. So in 20. 18, we had um, just raised our first round of funding, significant round of funding from VCs and angels for a little over a million dollars. We had big customers signed up, including Procter and Gamble and just several customers ready to go. Uh, 30 customers signed up for our product. So just a little context. We are a technology company. We make software and hardware for self-service retail. So we make vending machines and kiosks smart. So companies come to us to buy vending machines with our technology that helps them to collect data and, and to sell their products direct to customer faster. So we were ready to go, a lot of press, Forbes and all this stuff. And um, you know, we're a small company, so we were, as a lot of a lot of small businesses do, looking for the most affordable route, looking for the hookup price, looking for, you know, you get all these quotes and then you're like, I, this is too much. I'm gonna try to find a lower rate. And sometimes a lower rate isn't isn't the best and I've learned that the hard way. So we were looking for a company to build our machine for us. And we found a company that really sounded too good to be true. And they were too good to be true. <laughs> <laughs> we paid them to build our machine and they, they kept it, they stole it. And I think they realized, um, that they were giving us a quote that was very ambitious, but it was a legally binding agreement. Okay. And we hired them based on the cost that 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 they presented with us to us. And once they built it, they uh, decided that we owe them fifty thousand dollars more than they quoted us, which we didn't have the money. Hence, why we went looking for a more affordable solution. So it put us in a situation where we had customers, we couldn't deliver. Um, our product, they wouldn't give us our product without us paying them more money. And then, you know, come to find out that the product really didn't even work. So they couldn't even build it the way that they were supposed to. They kept our money and we ran out of money. So we raised over a million dollars and then we ran out of money. So we had no product, no money. And it was it was worse than COVID for me personally. Yeah, um, I, I was going to say, all right, so how much did you pay them? How, how much money exchange so hands? the contract was for thirty thousand um, dollars, okay. and that you know was for one prototype, which was um, reasonable. You know, not cheap, but reasonable compared to some of the big manufacturers that were quoting us um, 
what's called NRE, non-recurring engineering costs around $100,000. And again, we're a startup, especially 2018. We were just had our first round of money. And, um, you know, we thought we were going to take this prototype to the manufacturer and then they build it just to help us cut some costs. But then it came to find out that they couldn't even build a product that could be scalable or, or reproducible. Yeah, this, this is great. So I'm, I'm trying, and I think everybody needs to, to think about what Dawn just said, right? And I had lawyers, I see the comments like lawyers. I had lawyers, but I learned some things in this process about micro language that's put in the contract. They'll say little things like, um, you know, it, it's, the, it's a quote, it's not, the price could change, but then you make assumptions based on good relationships with people like, oh, they won't do that. They're great people, they're cool, we get along, we're friends. Yep. And they just didn't give me any indicator along the process. We talked every single week for six months. They never told me that the project was over budget. They waited till it was all the way finished, sent me a picture saying it's finished, and then said, oh, here's an invoice for $50,000. So, and I was like, I oh, mean, this, this is just because it, it's, it's not just them. I mean, I'm thinking that, oh, my God, I have investors now, and I've used their money, essentially, their money to invest in something that I'm not going to get, right? Wow. I mean, this this is this is like, that's the worst nightmare for any entrepreneur. But it here's is. the question though, here's it the is. question. Cause, cause I've, I've heard you tell this story, right? In different, different news outlets, but I'm gonna tell you Dawn what the first thing that came to mind is, and I haven't heard anybody ask you this, but I wanna be one, I want you to keep it 1000. Cause I know you're, you're in Ohio, right? Yes. I know a lot about Ohio, right? A matter <laughs> of fact, I would, I would for sure, like I, I, a lot of people don't realize this, and unfortunately, is that sometimes back in the day, I used to get into a lot of fights. I would, you know, throw throw the fists a little bit, but I would never throw it in Ohio. Never. I would not do it in Ohio. Or I would not do it in Ohio. I know how y'all get down in Ohio. I would not okay. do it in Ohio. So here's what I want to ask. Why didn't you get like thug with them? Because... I will tell you this. I remember when there was one guy, I went on this tour, this one guy held back a check of mine for $5,000. And I had somebody go knock on his door. Real talk. I had somebody go knock on his door to collect it, right? So I'm just curious, why didn't you go that route? Because I mean, I feel like- you know, I'm going to refer to a great Jay-Z quote that says, if I shoot you, I'm brainless. If you shoot me, I'm fake. You're famous. Something like that. And it's because I had too much to lose. Like I literally called my CTO and I said, I'm about to fly to California. I'm gonna take a baseball bat and I'm gonna go up in there. And I was so serious. Like, because I tried the lawyer. I did, I did the man letters. We did me, um, mediation. And they just would not give me the product. And so I said, I'm gonna go up there with a baseball bat. And if they don't give it to me, I'm going to just start just swinging and I'm going to bash it up. I'm just going to bash it. I'm just going to just destroy it. And then my CTO was like, are you crazy? I mean, I said this on a team meeting, like, guys, I have a solution. I'm going to go to California with the baseball bat and I'm going to walk in there and I'm going to just start swinging. And he was like, Dawn, why do you think that that's a solution? And I was so mad that... I just said, if, if if we can't have it, nobody can. Because what happened was, not only did they keep it, they had it in their showroom as like samples of their work, not knowing that, not telling people it doesn't even work and we stole it. And then to this day, like to this day, it's on their website and they're acting like it's their product. So it's an ongoing thing that I'm dealing with. But I just went and just, you know, it, it wasn't this simple because we ran out of money, but I knew I had to start all over again. And that was when I really started my business all over again, raising more money, finding a new manufacturer, getting everything built from scratch. But I, I, yeah, I wanted to go thug on them, but I could get sued yeah. and then I'll have less money. You no, know, you're, you're right. Your PTO is right. It's a good thing. We've never been in a business together because I would have been in that meeting like, all right, I'll, I'll be in the, I'll be with you. I'll be standing right behind you. Um, but I so, was ready. I was so ready to take that baseball bat. I could even visualize myself just crashing. And, I mean, I really was ready. And he's like, yeah. no, you're no, not doing good. that. Yeah. Good, no. good. That's a good CTO. Um, so, so then you go through this, right, this, this tumultuous situation. Talk to us about how that's connected with the crowdfunding raise, because that was a historic crowdfunding raise of, I think, over a million, technically over a million. Yeah. 
right? Yeah. How, how, how do those two connect? So after the product was taken, I went to all of my investors and I'm like, listen, the product got taken, but we do have customers. We have um, customers like PNG ready to go with us. All we need is just a little bit more money to rebuild the product. And I'm like, give me a hundred thousand dollars. This time I'll go rebuild the product. I'll be able to deliver it on time and we can recoup from this and we can go back to, you know, we can stay on course of revenue. And they were like, no, we don't think you can do it. We've basically written this off. You know, you're our basically only black founder in our portfolio and you done went and messed the money up by make, not making great decisions on who you hire to work with. And they just turned their back on me. You know, um, not every single one of them. I did have a few investors, including Backstage Capital and a few angels that were supportive and trying to help, but no one had enough money to really get me back on track. So um, I had one investor, Backstage Capital, they gave us about $50,000, which wasn't enough to keep going, but it was something, but it was enough for me to get creative. And that's when I looked into crowdfunding because I knew about the Jobs Act from you know a couple of years ago. I learned about it actually at the Black Enterprise Entrepreneurship Summit here in Columbus, Ohio and learned that um, Obama had passed this law that will allow companies to raise money from non-accredited investors. And non-accredited means people um, with less than a million in net worth and that make less than 200,000 as an individual, $300,000 as a couple. And so that's most of the people that I know. That's 98% of my people that I grew up with and my friends, um, you know, they're not accredited, but they have a good income and they, they can make investments. And so I said, okay, well, I have at this point a 17 year career in entrepreneurship. I started several businesses. I have a great following, a great network. I'm going to just go out to my network and see if I can raise money like this because that we would have had to shut down. You know, that could have, that could have easily put us out of business for sure. And then I said, okay, I'm just going to take the crowdfunding route. And um, it wasn't easy. It wasn't fast. Uh, during the process of waiting for the crowdfunding round to be approved by the SEC, I, I maxed out all of my, you know, all of my, all of my personal credit cards. I was 39 and I was saving money for my 40th birthday celebration world world tour. Right. So I had to spend all of that money for my birthday trip to keep my team paid, keep salaries paid, max out all of my credit cards to keep the business going. Um, and then still ran out, you know, ran out in December. So I was from August to December, I was paying for the whole business with my own money that I saved. My birthday, January 1st, I, I didn't, couldn't do a 40th birthday. Um, but it got to the point where I couldn't even afford an Uber. I didn't even have $5 to my name. And then right when I was at my last, Negative one hundred dollars. <laughs> the um the the SEC approved and opened up my raise, and it just it just took off. Wow, well, wow. I mean, that's just I th I think it's it's just incredible, right? Absolutely incredible. Um, so actually, here's the question. Yeah, do you hear that? Do you hear any feedback, or you're good? No, do you hear feedback? Crazy. Yeah, I'm starting to hear feedback. It was like everything was so no. cool. Everything's good. If, if you guys are, if you guys could hear anything, let me let me know if you can hear feedback. Because if it's just me, we we'll, we'll keep we'll keep rolling. Oh man, yeah. Andrew says he. Someone said feedback. You want me to click off the click back one, or we just want to push? Yeah, yeah. Try, let's let's try it one more time because it, it, this one is loud. But we'll, we'll try one one more time. And while we're doing that, actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah while you yeah you do that and then get we'll out play. and come back. Okay, I'm gonna leave. All right. So so here, here's here's where I where I want us to to, to go real quick with with Dawn. What I want you to, to know about Dawn, you could already see why I was doing that that rabbit hole right with her in terms of wanting to learn more is because, you know, she had been an entrepreneur, I think, at that point for 17 years. She was she had just raised money from VCs. She was at this moment where she was getting this 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 product that was going to be, you know, basically the the the, the road to her being able to scale. Someone steals it away from her. She can't go back to the VCs for any money. And so she decides to then just take all of the money she has and basically, what should I say, risk it, gamble it on this raise. It sounds very similar to what Mayana did, right? Very similar to what Mayana did. All right, let's 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 bring back uh, Dawn here. All right. Check, check. How does it sound? Oh, man, Dawn, I can't hear you. You can't hear me? No, not at all. Okay. No, no, I'm playing. I'm playing. I'm playing. I can hear you. <laughs> okay. All right. I know. It's bad. It's bad. <laughs> I'm terrible. All right. So now, all right. 
we're, 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 we're with you. We're in the moment. We're in the moment, right? Crowd, you, you had maxed out everything, had like, wait, you said $100. No, I said negative one hundred dollars. I was in the negative at this point. Yes, negative one hundred. I right. went from like a hundred thousand dollars to negative. This was my own money that I saved mm. for my nest egg, for my retirement, <laughs> for my life. It's done. <laughs> Nothing. It's, it's done. So, I put it all in my business, though. I put it all in my business. Okay. So, all right. I can ask you a million questions, but just because of time, I want to ask you one question here, then maybe two others, right? The one question I want to ask you here is, why did you risk it all at that moment, right? Because what I find to be fascinating about your career is that you've had a long career at this point. You've been pivoting, right? You've had you've been a part of lots of different businesses. Why did you say, I'm going to double down on this, opposed to just say, all right, I'm, you know, I'm just going to go do something else. Um, because I believed in it. I had been working on it for many years. I knew, like I said, I had customers. I had Procter & Gamble paid in full for this. I knew there was a market for it. And I also believe that if you're not willing to invest in yourself, why should anybody else invest in you? So I said, you know what? I'm going to put everything that I have into it to show everyone I'm in it too. I'm not just out here asking for you to believe in me and that I can't take myself out of my comfort zone you know, to, to double down on it. So I believed in it. It was a huge risk. Of course, my family was like, are you crazy? But I've done many crazy things in my entrepreneurial career. So I believed in it. And I knew that if I had the opportunity to um, open up my crowdfunding campaign, which at this point, it wasn't guaranteed. I knew that I could raise the money. I knew that I had a great following of investors and supporters. Okay. So you were right. <laughs> you were right. So then, so then what happened and what made that raise so historic? So this is 2018 December when it opened and it had, you know, uh, about $20,000 pretty quickly out the gate, which was exciting, but we were trying to raise the maximum of a million, you know, and um, it had never been done before by a female founder in the world. And so, and it's very new and it wasn't really a formula. So it was still a risk, you know, but, um, it was successful because my community really rallied behind me and in a way that was just phenomenal and just humbles me and makes me feel so grateful. But social media across all the platforms, of course, I definitely was very active blogging, posting all day, every day. Um, we also were had the opportunity to get on the Karen Hunter show, which Karen Hunter's followers are amazing. So they, you know, that really pushed it forward. And then I got on the breakfast club. And after that Breakfast Club interview, it just really took off. And we raised, you know, $600,000 in like two weeks, maybe, just from that momentum. And we oversubscribed it. And that made me the first female founder, not just black female, the first female founder to raise over a million dollars in a crowdfunding campaign. And we oversubscribed it, meaning we raised more money than we even wanted to. It got to the point where we had to take the invest button off the page because people wow. would not stop investing. Wow. So we raised... We stopped it at like 1.4 million, um, and remember the the limit is a million seventy thousand. So we stopped it at 1.4 million, and we just couldn't take the money because um, legally that we can't take more than a million seventy in a 12 month period. Okay. But it definitely was just uh, the momentum, um, the community, and my message that um, we have all that we need within our community, and and it's not an exclusionary message. Yeah. It's a message saying that. You know, the black community, we have all that we need within our community. We can fund our businesses. We can support our communities the way that other communities do. And people always talk about black people like the black dollar doesn't circulate. And black people don't support each other. Yes, we do. Yeah, yeah proof. Yes, we do. It's and I wanted, to, I wanted to prove that we do. And we yeah. do. Yeah. And, and also, too, I think there's there's always there's you know, I, I remember growing up, everybody would joke like, oh, you know what? Yeah. Whenever we try to support each other, but we never deliver on what we say we're going to do. Right. But here's a case where you over delivered. Right. Because yeah. after you were able to raise that money, then tell, talk to us about what happened the next year. Well, you know, after I raised that money, of course, I felt a great responsibility because. I mean, there's a stereotype that black people don't do what we say we're going to do or we get the money and we scam people. I mean, all kinds of things. Right. So I said, OK, I have to do this. I have to show them that we can do this. So I raised money at an eight million dollar valuation in 2019, meaning the value of my company was eight million dollars. I took that money. We rebuilt the entire prototype. 
Um, we went and secured customers again. We secured big customers. Um, some I can't even I can't even say, but in the alcohol beverage space and the cannabis space, um, we got a new manufacturer. We got our two patents pending. We made some new hires. So everything that we promised to do on our page, we did that and exceeded that. We also was able to get a higher valuation. So now our company valuation is twenty five million. So everybody that invested in at an eight million dollar valuation, those shares are now worth. You know that's 25 million so they're three times in value so i've three x in a year the value of those investments so someone invested ten thousand and it's now worth 30 a little over thirty thousand and so that was my vision to create wealth in the community to give my people my community the opportunity to invest in an early stage technology company something that we've never in history been able to do ever in history been able to do so, so, so just just so I'm clear, so basically investing in your company during the first crowd equity raise, I would have gotten a 300% return in, in one year? Yes, but it's not a return because you don't cash it out, but it's a value. It's a great value. Your equitable your, the value of your equity. We're not, they're not cashing it out. They're in it for the whole. Nobody wants to cash out right now. We, we're growing still, so. Darn. Don't. Nobody's asked to cash out. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think this is like this is such a beautiful story, right? And also, I think what adds to the beauty of it is this last raise that you just did, that you just closed. You did it during what's considered to be a, a horrific economy, right? So now, were you concerned about that, right? Were you concerned that you were raising during a recession and people didn't have the money to invest? I think that that's a misconception. So again, I always like to prove people wrong. So um, I was oversubscribed. So remember, we had like three hundred thousand dollars sitting that was invested that we couldn't take. So I said, okay, you guys, when the twelve month period hits, let's run this thing right back and see if we can keep this momentum going with our new progress and new traction. And we didn't know COVID was happening. We filed to do this back in October of last year. There was no COVID on the horizon. And so then this hit and it started happening and I'm like, oh my goodness, um, this is devastating to many people. I am aware that many people are affected, whether it's their health or even their jobs and their stability. However, there is significant wealth in our community still. There is significant wealth in our country still. And the fact that people um, are spending less money because they're not going out to eat, they're not out having drinks, socializing, they're not traveling, that disposable income that they may have had is still there. And so by making it an affordable investment of $250 as a minimum investment, I said, you know what, I'm going to show people that our community does have money still, that, you know, the black dollar is still strong, that we cannot be shut down by a pandemic. And, you know, when the stimulus check hit, people were investing their stimulus check. They weren't, and I just was, I couldn't believe it. I said, wow, you know, so I wanted to show that they underestimate us way mm. too often. Mm, mm. And I continue to show and demonstrate the power of group, group economics in our community is as strong as it was, you know, before integration. When we were a segregated country, the black community was thriving. Black businesses were thriving. And I would want, I really push to return to that where we, we are respected as um, an economic power to be reckoned with. There you go. Don, I'll tell you what, you, you, you just earned your nickname right there. Right okay. there, you just, you just earned it. Are you ready for it? Yes. You ready for it? All right. I don't know how the audience feels about this, but I feel good about this. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Dawn the queen of Black Wall Street. Okay. Gibson. Okay. The queen of Black Wall Street. I'll take that. Gibson. There you go, ladies I'll and gentlemen. That. that is her. So, 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 Dawn, tell us this. Tell us this, right? And th this one is, I'm, I'm ready. I got my pen. I'm ready to take notes. <clears throat> There's so many lessons you can share with us. So many lessons. I want you to think back throughout your entire career, actually. Okay. What if you, if there was only that one lesson? One lesson, powerful lesson to leave us with, what would that be? Trust yourself. You know more than you think you do. It's all in us. It's, it, it's inside of us. We're born with this. And um, you just trust yourself. That voice in your head, that first voice you hear is the right 
thing. And so I never had any doubts because I trusted myself. So when you're like, why did you put all your money into it? I trusted myself. Myself told me to. Why did you raise money despite COVID? Because I told myself to. Why did you turn away VC money to give your community a chance? Because I told myself to. And sometimes the voice sounds crazy. I'm like, what? Turn down a check. But it's like, yes, trust yourself. That'll get you far in life. I tell you what, Don. How can we support you? I've already seen people, I've seen five messages go through to say, how can we invest? How can we invest? Dawn, yes. can we still invest? Yes, you can still invest. Um, okay. at, on the, the link, uh, startengine.com forward slash popcom. It will tell you that you're on a wait list, but just wait. It will happen. I can't say anything else legally, but just wait. Um, it is a real investment. So if you go ahead and Invest, just wait, and then you'll hear from us. But um, that's how you can support. Or, you know, if it's not the right time to invest, share. Tell somebody about it. Reshare on social media. Tell a friend. Um, that's it. Word of mouth is a powerful thing, and, and everything matters. So your referral is just as good as money for me because the more it spreads, the more it goes viral. So I just greatly appreciate you. Yeah, there you go. I tell you what, y'all. Support. John, I think you just got a couple thousand folks who are who are rushing to this real quick. Um, I think your story is inspirational. I think you are um, just phenomenal, and uh, like I'm, I'm just so happy that we connected. I'm so happy to be able to try to throw some support your way, and I will continue to support. I was trying to to get on that list today. You know, so we raised two million over two million, two point five million in one year. So this is. Amazing. From the community, I would I would really say 90% or more of my investors are black people. So that's over 3,000 black angel investors. And they say we don't invest. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and also, too, it's like, I think your product is perfect for this new economy. It's like, it's, it's the perfect yeah. storm. I think about how, you know, uh, and actually, I think you actually mentioned this in one of the 500 interviews I watched you, uh, but you were like, you know, it took me this long to be an overnight success. And I, and I think what's so powerful is that your entire test, your story and your all the different pivots and all the different businesses, it's a testament to why we just have to be patient, as you said, exactly. right? Why we have to be patient, how it all comes together. Dawn, the queen Thank of you. Black Wall Street, Dixon. There she is. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, put that on a shirt quick. I am. I am. Dawn, thank you so much. We greatly appreciate it. Everybody. Bye, everyone. Have a lovely weekend, and thank you for tuning in. This is valuable, so thank you. There you go, Dawn. Everybody, that's Dawn right there. Dawn Dixon, I'm telling you, go down the rabbit hole, read more about her story. It's incredible. I think you've already heard enough uh, to invest. This is, I think, it's just it's just incredible. It's just, just, just incredible. That's all I have to say. All right, guys. Here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to do right now. All right. First thing, first thing first is I want you to make sure you're on this. All right. Cause I'm getting ready to, I'm getting, I'm getting ready to jump into comments. So first make sure you're on this, you get a full recap. I'm going to break down all the little nuggets, you know, of today, everything that I heard, uh, from everybody. Let me see if I can recap. So we had Andrew, the Diddy of events, Roby, right? That was the Diddy of events. We saw how he was able to remix, rebrand things. Love that, right? Then we had uh, who was it? Was it was it Nana? Was it was it was it the Yoda of Data Next? Where I loved Yana. My big my big takeaway from Nana, I called him Yana. <laughs> Did you see that? I was like Yoda and Nana. Yana, maybe that should be his name, Yana. But I loved how he was fixated on not just the data, but I loved how he was all about. Let me figure out how I can learn from my avatar. Right, not sell to them, learn. So, so I completely love that. Right, uh, for Carla, right, Carla the shark. I think she showed us how we must keep moving. We must keep moving as an entrepreneur. You must keep moving. And also, what I take from Carla is there's always a way. There's always a way. There's always a way. Right. So that was really exciting. There, uh, man, Lee. Lee has some Prince vibes, right? We're about to hear from Lee in a second. Lee's going to play us out uh, so we can mix it up in the comments. Uh, but with Lee in particular, with the Prince vibes is, I think what Lee is showing us is something 
that by the way, I've been saying on all of these sessions, that is, is that we have to build our own and the importance of building our own platforms and owning our own spaces. That was really what I'm taking away from, from Lee. Uh, with Mayana, man, the gardener, right? Mayana, what I loved about Mayana's story is how she was willing to risk it all. I mean, think about that. She had $1,000 left and opposed to lay everybody off. She said, you know what I'm going to do? I believe in my data, right? I believe in my skills. I believe in my team. I believe in my network. I'm going to double down in this one area and look at the return. I mean, amazing return. In, in Jamaica, that's over a million Jamaican dollars, all right? Over a million Jamaican dollars in three weeks. Um, and then last but not least, we have none other than the queen of Black Wall Street. And by the way, I could just call her the queen of Wall Street, right? In a second, I think she's just gonna be the queen of Wall Street, but that's Dawn, the black, the Dawn, the queen of Black Wall Street for the moment, but I think it will be Wall Street very soon. Uh, but uh, but Dawn's story is so powerful, right? So, um, you know, we just heard it. I don't wanna belabor it, but let me just say, just go research more uh, about her. So that being said, we're gonna bring back Prince right now. And what I want you guys to do is use this as an opportunity to connect with anyone. So we used to do Let's Connect at the beginning of these sessions. Let's do that right now. If there is if there is something that you need help with, if there's something that you need help with, write what that is with hashtag Let's Connect. You need a digital marketer. You need someone to help you to invest. You need someone to help you do an event. Put that in with the hashtag Let's Connect. And then if you see someone who is actually saying, hey, they're, they're, they're mentioning something that you have a skill in, right? You are an event planner. You are someone who does digital marketing. Then tag their name, use their name, and then use hashtag Let's Connect. We'll do that for just about two, three minutes while this man plays us out. <laughs> and maybe he'll sing something. Maybe he'll sing something. We'll see. We'll see if we can get him to sing something. But, um, but Lee. Thank you, man. All right, for sure, man. Thank you. Everybody out there earning it, man. Everybody out there going to get it, all right? It's for y'all.